The concept of a password isn't new, but its nonverbal application is a relatively modern development. In earlier eras, passwords were typically used by sentries and soldiers and spies, wanting to identify enemies in their midst, and to figure out when they've encountered an ally with whom they're meant to share information or provide access, rather than an enemy hoping to trick them into divulging secrets or to let them past the heavily guarded gates. Over time, these passwords, or passcodes, or signs, as they were sometimes called, became more sophisticated, and one of the more common upgraded applications through World War II was the use of a password followed by a counter password, or a sign followed by a countersign. One person sang, for instance, pigeon, while the other responded daffodil, and that would tell both parties they've met up with the right person, despite not knowing each other, not knowing what the other person would look like ahead of time, and so on. This allowed people to create a layer of trust in an otherwise trust-free environment, and this method was improved upon with the advent of ever-changing passwords, which would be swapped out every few days to make sure a captured soldier's password or counter-password, stolen by the enemy under duress, wouldn't give them access to anything important for more than a day or two after they gave it up. Similar trust-generating tools were used from the early days of computer networking. As a computer network, whether we're talking about two computers directly connecting to each other over a cable, or computers connecting via an intermediary service, like a local area network or the internet, would want to be sure they were linking up to the correct device, lest they send information or grant access or control to a malevolent actor, someone wanting to hack or otherwise mess with them. Passwords were also often added to the user-facing interfaces of computers from the early 1960s onward, which made it more difficult for unauthorized people to access scarce and expensive computing resources, while also, from the 1970s onward, protecting stored passwords using cryptography that was initially based on an old-school rotor cryptography machine. This cryptographic storage approach made it a lot less likely that computer users would just stumble upon someone else's password in a readable form, but it also made hacking computer resources more difficult because you wouldn't just need to get past security defenses. You would also need to decrypt the encrypted passwords after you stole them, which wasn't easy, as even the earliest version of this cryptography applied its encryption algorithm 25 times, making some types of brute force decryption those that rely upon trying a bunch of combinations of words and characters, and then trying the same with common encrypted versions of those words and characters applied, a lot less effective. Modern passwords are used for just about everything, from securing our lockers at the gym to securing our bank accounts and the SIM cards in our phones. They're also used on pretty much everything online, which has resulted in a state of affairs in which most of us have dozens if not hundreds of passwords to manage, and that's made reusing passwords across all these services and platforms and sites and apps a lot more appealing which creates a vulnerability for hackers to exploit in an age of ever-improving hacking tools and ever more exploitable software bugs. If they can get our password on one maybe leaky and badly defended service or website, they can possibly reuse that password again on a more well-defended and important service. What I'd like to talk about today are password vaults and what a password-free future might look like. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. But you can also support this and all of my work at understandery.com. Folks who support this show via either of those methods gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support Let's Know Things, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. (music) 
A password manager is a type of app, a bit of software, that stores a bunch of passwords behind another single password. These apps are also sometimes called password vaults, as they basically serve as a lockbox in which you store other passwords, which in turn means you can memorize just the one password, the password that allows you to access all the other ones, and the app will then typically allow you to autocomplete or easily copy and paste passwords from your vault into other apps and web pages and so on. The theory is that having just one password to memorize instead of a bajillion of them should allow users to make that password really, really good and really hard to crack by conventional means. And the passwords inside that vault, because they will be primarily copied and pasted or just auto-filled wherever they're needed, can then all be unique and also quite high-end and high-quality, very hard to crack. The sort of passwords that tend to be difficult to memorize because they're just a jumble of characters, but which are really effective in part because of that same cumbersomeness. So these apps tend to be pretty useful, and they've been broadly promoted by the InfoSec, the information security community, as solid options for folks who want to adhere to the best practices for passwords without having to memorize hundreds of long strings of arbitrary characters. Some of these services are free, some cost money, but all of them do essentially the same thing for password management, and most also allow you to store private notes and other sorts of information behind that main password as well, like credit card numbers and expiration dates, membership information, software serial numbers, stuff like that. That utility and popularity, though, has always been at least somewhat controversial because despite how well-girded and bulwarked against attack many of the companies behind these tools are, there's always the chance such tools will amplify the popularity of bad password practices, generating weak, crackable codes for their users. And there's always the chance that a single hack of a hard target, a password manager, or the cloud service they use to store their customers' data could grant access to not just a single account, but all of the accounts owned by all of their users, from their Facebook logins to their bank account PIN numbers to their apartment building access codes. Each component of these apps, too, provides another access point for malevolent actors. So while it might be convenient for users to have a bookmarklet or other in-browser mini-app, which helps auto-fill fields on websites with that user's login info, that's one more potential vulnerability, as is every component of their user interface, all of the services that they use for authorization purposes, all of the app marketplaces they use, and all of the countless issues that exist with the variety of browsers folks have downloaded for different purposes on their different devices. So while the companies behind these services have been pretty stalwart and fortunate in their defense of all this data up till this point, vulnerabilities have been found, including those identified by researchers across a slew of such services in 2014, intrusions that were detected in a few of them in 2015, new flaws that were identified in 2016, including a critical zero-day flaw that, if exploited, would have allowed hackers to completely compromise hacked accounts, and a few small successful hacks that occurred in 2017. More vulnerabilities were discovered by researchers in 2018, and a company called Keeper had its servers publicly exposed that same year. In 2019, leaks were found in several password managers' apps. In 2020, a bunch of phishing vulnerabilities were discovered in a handful of password management services. And in 2021, attackers were able to hack a company called Password State through its update functionality. One such company, called LastPass, was involved in or exploited by almost every single one of those previous vulnerabilities and hacks. And in August of 2022, the company notified their customers that there had been a security incident within its development environment, with hackers able to get inside their back-end platform, lurk around for four days, and then steal some of the software's code and technical information. They assured customers that there was no evidence that hackers took info or encrypted password data, and that was that. But in December of 2022, the company reported that the hackers had subsequently taken a backup of customer data and their password databases using info from those previous hacks. So customer names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, IP addresses, and partial credit card numbers, alongside databases filled with unencrypted URLs of websites they had visited and encrypted usernames and passwords for those sites. 
The company once again reassured its users that there was mostly nothing to worry about as the encryption they used would take millions of years to decrypt using conventional means. But while most people are just fine and still well protected, they might want to change all their passwords just in case, said the company. And to be clear, that means every password contained in their vault should be changed, which for some people is hundreds of them. A few notes on this sequence of events before we move forward. First is that LastPass would seem to have sat on this information for at least a brief period, possibly so they could announce this new hack-related information right before people left for their end-of-the-year holiday break on December 22nd which they maybe thought would help reduce the spread of news stories related to this failure to protect their users' information. Second is that their statement on the hack seems, based on analysis by cybersecurity experts, to be filled with half-truths, omissions, and lies, with one security researcher calling it, quote, aggressively misleading, end quote. Third is that this hack, and what's been divulged as a consequence, shows that LastPass was collecting data on its users, like their IP addresses, which could make even the unencrypted portions of their data useful for hackers, as it may allow them to track a person's movements and behaviors around the web, with all the privacy invasion that implies. And finally, most security experts are still recommending password vaults for most people, but they are now, if they weren't already, suggesting folks switch to a different one rather than using LastPass. The paid option, 1Password, and the free option, Bitwarden, are the two most commonly recommended, but there are a bunch that have generally favorable reviews from security experts these days, and LastPass, after all these years of vulnerabilities and breaches, has not fit into that highly recommended, generally favorable category for a long time. So one takeaway from this might be that even the tools meant to prevent us from hacks can provide another threat surface through which we can be hacked, and an especially appealing one, since it's a veritable treasure chest of other login-related and personal information that we understandably assume will be kept secure. Another is that the company behind these sorts of tools matters, and there's always the chance that a company will just have bad practices from day one, but will sell themselves, will market and brand themselves as being secure to people who don't have any reason to know any better. But there's also a chance that a secure company will be sold, or the leadership will change for some other reason, and they could thus become less secure because of how the new owners manage things. All of which implies that while these vaults can be very secure, solid options for many people, it's also probably prudent to keep up with the behind-the-curtains happenings on the business side of things, lest a financial change in fortune or a shakeup in the boardroom lead to inferior security practices, which then ultimately result in the exposure of personal information that you had every reason to assume would never be exposed. It's also worth considering that passwords, which are so vital to online operation today, might soon become some of the most vulnerable protections we use if the much-vaunted quantum computing space comes of age before we're able to change our passwords to account for this new reality. Experts are mixed on what the advent of practical and widespread quantum computing will actually mean for this space, and some contend that we could see computers capable of cracking even the most sophisticated, secure passwords in seconds, while others say, no, it'll likely still take a month or a year or more than that. Though that's arguably still amazing, compared to the millions of years some passwords would take to crack using conventional computing today. Whatever the specifics turn out to be, though, the possibility that all passwords could soon be more fragile has a lot of government and corporate entities in a tizzy trying to figure out how to secure trustless environments like the internet, lacking the long, leaned-upon signs and countersigns, passwords and counter-passwords we've used to keep everyone honest and to make sure we're connecting to the right things. One possible next step option was announced by tech company Apple in June of 2022 and deployed with its iOS 16, iPad OS 16, and Mac OS Ventura operating system updates as an attempt to replace password use on Apple devices. 
To be clear, this was their implementation of a shared project that Apple, Google, and Microsoft have worked on together, alongside the FIDO Alliance, which is an organization focused on generating and promoting non-password authentication standards, and the W3C, which is the organization that manages web standards. The idea was to collectively invest in an alternative to passwords that would achieve the same outcome, and to base that alternative on authentication methods users are already familiar and comfortable with, like face scans or pins or fingerprint IDing, approaches that are already used in many modern personal electronic devices, like smartphones and laptops. Apple's version of this standard is called PassKey, and it basically allows those who opt in to use Face ID, Touch ID, or a PIN number to validate login attempts rather than having to remember usernames and passwords. Folks who use this standard today will generally have to go through typical sign-up processes, but then their login credentials will be saved to their iCloud keychain, which is a password-saving service baked into Apple accounts that's a bit like a password manager, but with passkey attached, so it can allow for the more seamless use of these credentials, but ostensibly with the same level of security afforded to device logins. In theory, once fully implemented, this approach will work across devices and platforms, allowing folks to, for instance, sign in with a face scan on their iPhone, but then use a fingerprint scan on their Windows laptop and a PIN number on their Android tablet. All the devices made by and using operating systems produced and maintained by different companies, but all of them capable of tapping into that central collection of login credentials and certifying that the person being scanned or typing in a PIN is who they say they are. This shared cloud of credentials is then protected by a pair of keys, one public and one private. That way, if a server is compromised, like with LastPass, the lack of users' personal keys would prevent hackers from utilizing that stolen info. At the moment, this password alternative is a bit of a novelty, as not many websites or apps use it, so it's there, in bare-bones form, but not yet functional enough that most people can stop using passwords. There's a chance that at some point in the next few years, though, the tech and understanding required to store pass keys will become just as commodified as the tech for storing passwords has become. And this technology will represent a real-deal alternative to passwords and then possibly someday become the new standard, replacing passwords almost entirely and making the hack of individuals and vaults a thing of the past until a reliable means of hacking passkey systems is discovered or developed, at least. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, but you can also become a member at understandery.com. Folks who support this show via either of those means gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support Let's Know Things, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called Rosewater by Tade Thompson. This is the first book in a trilogy called the Wormwood Trilogy, and I struggled with a way to describe this without giving away too much, so I'm just going to read the description of the book from Goodreads to you, which I think gives a fairly good idea of what to expect from that description. Tade Thompson's Rosewater is the start of an award-winning, cutting-edge trilogy set in Nigeria by one of science fiction's most engaging new voices. Rosewater is a town on the edge, a community formed around the edges of a mysterious alien biodome. Its residents comprise the hopeful, the hungry, and the helpless, people eager for a glimpse inside the dome or a taste of its rumored healing powers. Caro is a government agent with a criminal past. He is seen inside the biodome and doesn't care to again, but when something begins killing off others like himself, Caro must defy his masters to search for an answer, facing his dark history and coming to a realization about a horrifying future. Now this is back to me speaking, this first book in the series, Rosewater, is very good. I've read all three books though, and they're all quite good. The whole trilogy is worth a read if you're looking for something interesting by an author who, so far at least, I've been very impressed by. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Rosewater by Tade Thompson. 
You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this and every episode at letsknowthings.com. If you enjoy this show, you might also enjoy One Sentence News. You can find out more about that at onesentencenews.com or by searching for One Sentence News wherever you get your podcasts. And I've got a brand new project as well called Notes on the News. You can find out more about that and subscribe for free if you care to at notesonthenews.com. Feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and on YouTube, and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. (music) 